Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. You can subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast, at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite download service, and never miss the great content we offer. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Hello and welcome to the War Room Podcast. I'm Jacqueline Witt, Professor of Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and the Editor-in-Chief of War Room, and I'm really happy to be back in the studio today recording the podcast. I have as my guest today Eric Farnsworth, who is Vice President of the Council of the Americas in Washington, D.C., He's a recognized expert on Western Hemisphere affairs, as well as a widely sought after conference speaker, media commentator, and policy advisor. Eric has been a podcast guest with us before, uh, back in 2018, on an episode titled Good Border Fences Make Good Neighbors, question mark, uh, where he and Colonel Ian Lyles offered a survey overview of the state of affairs in regional security in the Western Hemisphere. So now we're two years on and we're back in the studio with Eric to talk about the Western Hemisphere and issues in early 2020. Uh, So Eric, welcome back to A Better Peace. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks for having me back. All right. So two years in some ways feels like a long time. (laughs) In other ways, it feels like not very long at all. Uh, But we'll start with a question really about American interests and United States interests in Latin America. Uh, So how, in in your mind, how does the United States define its interest in the rest of the Western Hemisphere in Latin America? Uh, and are there sort of cultural, historical, or economic factors that are most salient in understanding how this relationship has developed? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you say it's been two years and a lot's changed, but a lot hasn't changed. And I think that's exactly right. And one of the things that really hasn't changed is U.S. core interests in the Western Hemisphere. There are some basic pillars here on which the United States uh, sees its uh, its national interests. The first, of course, is security of the homeland, uh, which is a core national interest that we would see for any region of the world. But what that means is is that we know who is coming into our country and we know what is coming into our country and we try to uh, restrict the things that uh, in the uh, belief of the um, politicians in Washington could do harm to American citizens. So whether that's drugs or whether it's contraband or uh, illegal activities, uh, that's that's clearly something that uh, attracts Mm -hmm. uh, attention in the Western Hemisphere context. Uh, That's number one. Number two is economic well-being of uh, U.S. citizens and Latin America and the Western Hemisphere more broadly uh, is a very important part of U.S. economic well-being in terms of trade, in terms of uh, investment, in terms of economic growth. Uh, You know, our number one trade partner in the entire world is Canada, Mm -hmm. uh, and Mexico is one of our top two or three, depending on, uh, you know, the the time of the uh, statistics. So uh, this is a really important part of the world uh, and other countries as well. So trade and economic uh, connection is critically important for the United States. Uh, And I would also add then as well that, uh, at least in terms of how Washington views core interests for the Western Hemisphere, the denial of the region to outside actors, I think historically, has been an important uh, core value. Mm -hmm. And now that meant, you know, in the 1800s, things like the Monroe Doctrine. And even though we don't talk about things like that anymore, nonetheless, the idea that maybe Russia is working in Venezuela or China has uh, uh, an economic uh, presence in the Western Hemisphere, that does attract the attention of certain folks in Washington. Uh, and so it is viewed as a, a core interest to at least uh, have a sense of um, the ability of the United States to uh, uh, try to work with partners in the region to promote certain values. And at times that means uh, working against the interest of some of the outside actors. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty straightforward from that perspective. Uh, you know, in the historical context or in the context of, uh, you know, elections and uh, political cycles, Uh, There is some nuance. Uh, At times, uh, core interests are seen as development activities as well in the Western Hemisphere. Sometimes they're not. Uh, Sometimes core activities are seen uh, in terms of uh, focusing, for example, on Cuba or uh, on Venezuela, and sometimes they're not. So there's some nuances there between administrations. But I think if you look at what are the core 
uh, aspects of security, at least in broad baskets, those would be the ones that okay. uh, that I would. Uh, and these sh- these really talk track about. with American core interests globally. I think so. Uh, with specific sort of flavors uh, based on geographic proximity, uh, some cultural ties, some historical ties, yep. as well. So what happens then if we flip the question and we think about how Latin American countries, which is obviously a, a very broad and diverse range, uh, and we may not be able to make really solid um, sort of generalizations for the for the whole of the region, but maybe an exemplar or two about how do Latin American countries see their interest vis-a-vis mm. the U.S.? You know, something you said is really important to emphasize, and that is that there is no quote-unquote Latin America, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it is a region made up of independent sovereign countries, some with different histories, some with different languages, all with different relationships with, for example, the United States. I think that's a really important point that you make and a great point of departure. And so based on that, they're going to have different relationships with the United States. In some cases, for example, the Mexicos, the Central Americans, the Caribbean countries, issues like immigration loom very very, very large. Why? Because, well, uh, citizens are traveling to the United States, but also in some countries like El Salvador or Honduras or indeed Mexico, Dominican Republic, countries like this, remittances of citizens who are present in the United States and sending money back to Mm. their home countries is a really important part of national GDP. I mean, it's something that really drives economic growth in some of these countries. So it's an economic reality. So Uh, for the U.S., the economic consideration is often trade, Whereas maybe in a smaller country in Honduras or, or Guatemala, the one of the major economic factors is remittances back to the country. It's not a formal trade relationship. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. right. That's absolutely right. And so even though a country like El Salvador does have certain trade relationship with the United States, uh, its top foreign currency earner is remittances from mm-hmm. its citizens in the U.S. Now, El Salvador is probably an extreme example in that context. And the farther away you go from the United States, for example, as you get toward South America, uh, you have less of a migration issue, less of a remittances issue for right. obvious reasons, right? Because uh, it's more difficult to get to the U.S. Uh, and also some of the economies of South America, at least until recently, have been doing pretty well. So the migration migration flows really haven't been as significant. But there are other issues as well in terms of how countries would define their interests with the United States. Everybody wants to trade with the U.S. Everybody wants to trade with the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, And why? Because the U.S. is the largest economy in the world and so has the largest market in the world. And so even countries like Venezuela, which have a very uh, difficult relationship with the U.S. right now, want to sell to the U.S. Until recently, the U.S. was the largest uh, consumer of or the largest importer of Venezuelan Mm -hmm. crude. So even when the politics of the moment uh, are very difficult, the commercial relationship can nonetheless continue. So I do think you see some nuances there. And then I think also most countries uh, really see the United States as a source of uh, important advances in technology and in capital and in uh, investment Mm -hmm. uh, that can help them develop in their own way. Now, each country, of course, is going to have a little different investment climate. They're going to have different regulations. They're going to have different sectors that they want to focus on. But by and large, they do see the United States, at least in that perspective, in a positive manner. So there are a lot of similarities. The region is vastly different top to bottom, no question about it, but but there are some similarities. It strikes me, too, that when we talk about U.S., relations with another country. Um, Sometimes we want to think of that as a monolithic relationship, like Venezuela is sort of in an adversarial or or competitive relationship uh, with the United States. But your your answer brings up that there are many facets to an international, even a bilateral relationship. Yeah, there's no question. And you start to add in multilateral and sort of international organizations and things get even more complicated. So countries can cooperate on one area and be non-cooperative in, a, in another and that's a that's a just a matter of course in the diplomatic world i think it's right let me give you two quick examples along those lines mexico uh first uh we just concluded the united states just concluded the usmca trade agreement with uh, mexico and canada uh clearly there is a very deep economic relationship between the us and mexico but under the uh presidency of andres manuel lopez obrador amlo for short in mexico uh mexican foreign policy has shifted uh, in some ways to be uh uh, not opposed necessarily, but uh, different from U.S. policy in the region uh, toward uh, Venezuela, toward uh, Cuba, toward international institutions. And so we can see that where the two countries might be cooperating on the economic side, they might diverge on the political side internationally. Another excellent example, I think, would be Brazil. Traditionally, Brazil has seen its role 
internationally in some way is opposing the U.S. interests in the region, at least from a political perspective, to organize Latin America as a Brazilian uh, sphere of mm -hmm. influence and try to keep the United States um, uh, out of Latin America, so to speak. But uh, under um, even under those uh, those periods of time, the United States has still cooperated very closely with Brazil on some economic uh, issues, but also, for example, on international peacekeeping issues. Right. And this wouldn't necessarily be something you would think about for two huge countries, uh, which maybe are, you know, uh, sizing each other up uh, mm -hmm. and maybe warily a little bit, but cooperating very closely on international peacekeeping uh, throughout the world. And so I think there are areas of, of connectivity there, uh, even if the politics of the moment aren't exactly aligned. Are a little bit tense. Yeah, a yeah. little bit tense. Having said that, uh, under the current uh, administration in both Brazil and the United States, both of those countries are coming closer together. So okay. uh, we are seeing a, a shift in, yeah. in that traditional posture as well. So this brings me, I think, to my next question, which is about regional security issues um, and how the region collectively uh, or the major players within it, um, what do they view as the major issues confronting the Western Hemisphere? And then where are the areas of consensus and disagreement, uh, broadly speaking? Yeah, if you're a country like a Cuba or a Venezuela or a Nicaragua, your uh, primary security threat would be perceived as the United States because the U.S. has uh, clearly uh, indicated a disapproval of those particular governments and is working in some ways to uh, change behavior, if not the governments mm -hmm. themselves. So, uh, But I think you have to take those countries and, and lay them aside. I think the broader uh, security interests of the region are clearly on uh, issues of, of um, main maintaining order. And what I mean by that is not necessarily political order, but order in the street. I mean, crime and mm -hmm. criminal activities, uh, and it's not just muggings and kidnappings, but it's uh, cyber crime. It's, uh, you know, more sophisticated levels of crime as well. Uh, these are issues that are um, really bad in some countries. And if you look at, for example, surveys of the most dangerous cities in the world, uh, you know, the top 20 most dangerous cities, for example, you know, 17 or 18 of them are going to be cities in Latin America. It's extraordinary how, uh, you know, the, 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 the problem of violence and crime uh, has, has been allowed to explode. And I think these are fundamental issues because not only is it the ability of Latin American citizens to conduct their daily lives, in some ways it also challenges the very idea of a democratic society. Because if you have a country like, you know, parts of Mexico or parts of Colombia or, you know, parts of South America where the writ of the state really doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything, I mean, what is the what is the nature of sovereignty under those contexts? Right. And, and so whether it's drug traffickers or whether it's, uh, you know, smugglers or whether it's people involved involved in criminality in some other way, um, you know, they pose a challenge to the state. And so, uh, and I'm not talking about political challenge or overthrowing necessarily. I mean, yes, you've got the FARC and the ELN and Colombia and Venezuela, but, um, but broadly speaking, this is an issue of of crime, not politics. But having said that, it does challenge right. each of the countries and, and, it, and, and they it have to deal with it. It has some transnational challenges as well, right? Because the, of, all of these things can cross borders easily things can spill over. So there are internal dynamics and uh, regional sort of dynamics at, at play. And then you have right, right these trends and patterns um, where information sharing sort of technical expertise uh, sharing among governments is an interesting, interesting problem. There's no question about it. Really good point. And in the protests that we've seen across Latin America, for example, last year in 2019, there were some allegations, for example, that uh, some of the protests were being uh, if not uh, begun, at least amplified mm -hmm. by outside, okay. you know, uh, agents from from other countries. And so you do have at least allegations along those lines. But the good news is in the Western Hemisphere, and this is really good news, is this is the only region of the world that does not have state to state conflict. It's the only region mm -hmm. of the world. There are not two countries that are close to fighting against right. each other. And so in the security... Even like border skirmishes, like you just don't hear, they're just not a persistent part it's of the not security at, Not at this point in history. Yeah. It is a remarkable achievement for the region. And as bad as things may be in terms of the criminal activity in some places, the good news is that you just don't have that state-to-state -state conflict. So when it comes to things like security, I mean, these aren't even issues that people have to worry that much about. Are there potential areas? Yes, there are. Most likely, you know, on some of the borders around Venezuela. Uh, I suppose anybody could come up with other scenarios as well. But as of the current moment, this There's is a couple of maritime claims. Still well, out yeah, there and, but, you, you know, know, again, are, here and there. Those are perpetual. Right? <laughs> but, but, but that's some of the good news. Yeah, good.
Um, the United States, if I think about what we talk about here at the War College um, in the courses writ large, a lot of attention and a lot of ink and words have been spilled about this idea of a return to great power competition, mm. which for the United States means Russia and China. Mm -hmm. um, and so it seems in this sort of rethinking about the, the way we organize the world uh, that Latin America sometimes is left out or an afterthought, that we know it's an, inco an economy of force effort relative to, say, CENTCOM or UCOM or Indopaycom. And so here's your here's your chance to sort of make your pitch. <laughs> I guess it's for, like, broadly speaking, national security professionals, um, what are some of the things that they should be thinking about, even as we're talking about a return to great power competition for the U.S.? Well, there are several things there. Uh, one is uh, the idea of return on investment. And what that means is that a little bit of investment in Latin America uh, and security cooperation goes a long way. I mean, we're dealing with democratic societies here. We're dealing with countries that, broadly speaking, share our values and that want to cooperate with the United States. And so a little bit of attention, a little bit of resources, a little bit of uh, working together, the return is quite high. If you lay that against, for example, the return uh, to investment in other parts of the world, here let me just mention the Middle East, not because I'm a Middle East expert, but because, you know, it seems as if things in the Middle East aren't that good these days. Having said that, we've spent One a lot- One might draw that. We <laughs> draw that conclusion. Indeed. Yeah. But we've spent a lot of money. We've spent, you know, lives and in, in, in human, uh, uh, you know, uh, difficulties there. And, and, and that's a reality. But my point is that, you know, if you're looking at this as, a, as an investment return proposition, just a little bit in the Western Hemisphere really does return quite a lot. So I think that's point number one. In terms of the, uh, Western, uh, the great power competition, the point that I just made, you don't have to have that conversation in Beijing. You don't have to have that conversation in Moscow. Mm. They get it. They're paying a little bit of attention. They're paying a lot of attention to the Western Hemisphere. And the, the, they are making strides in terms of influence, in terms of uh, supporting their own interests in the Western Hemisphere, even as the United States is for our own reasons, but we're looking elsewhere. And so... Uh, no, I don't think, you know, China's not coming into the Western Hemisphere because they want to threaten the United States or they want to have a base of operations to march troops into Texas. That has nothing it's to not do with like reality. Risk. It's not like risk, uh, you know, not at all. But China sees opportunity in the Western Hemisphere. China sees a huge expanse of, 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 uh, of territory in terms of uh, natural resources and trade and economics and gaining influence with very important countries in the global context. Uh, and it also sees the ability to um, to promote its own value set globally uh, and to promote its own interests globally. And whether that's in terms of how uh, China is trying to promote uh, the Taiwan issue or the Uyghur issue or the South China Sea issue, if you can uh, export those values uh, issues into the Western Hemisphere and get Latin Americans at least to remain silent, if not to be you know, advocates for your position, mm -hmm. uh, that's a huge strategic win for China. And so that little bit of investment is having huge dividends yeah. in, in that context. So the same like return on investment proposition that exists for the United States is also true for for China and and other actors absolutely in and, some ways. and you know the Russia example is even even more uh, I think direct Russia's uh, paying a lot of attention to Venezuela mm. uh, and uh, they're getting a lot of return for it uh, they are getting Venezuelan oil that they're selling in the uh, international market making money. They are selling weapons to Venezuela, making money. And what's it costing Russia? Nothing. It costs right. Russia nothing. And, you know, at the same time, they're also um, really uh, scrambling the, um, the uh, calculations of the United States in the Western Hemisphere, because by supporting the Maduro regime in Venezuela, it makes U.S. Uh, policy uh, more difficult. It changes the calculus. Uh, it introduces uncertainty in the region. And you know, if you're in Moscow, this is a this is a fabulous uh, example of doing you know getting a huge return for almost mm -hmm. no cost whatsoever. It's it strikes me that the the reason Latin America and other parts of the world that aren't in Russia or Russia's immediate back sort of neighborhood or China or China's immediate neighborhood, they matter because the global the sphere of competition is is global, right? It's not just regional; it's transnational and international. Um, and so the triangulation of relationships between, say, the United States and Moscow, and 
capitals in, in Central and South America. Um, it's going to require expertise in multiple places uh, sort of coming together rather than Right, the Russia desk or a, a Russia hand, yeah. sort of having all of the all of the answers. Well, I think that's exactly right, and and it brings an important nuance into the conversation, and that is that you know if we see Latin America through the lens of great power competition with either Russia or China or both or some other country like mm-hmm. Iran, uh, we really run the risk of. Uh, making some of the mistakes we made during the Cold War, which is to say we saw Latin America as a uh, an area of global competition with the Soviet Union. And so the things that we did during that time period were made all of the sense in the world, perhaps in the context of competing with the Soviet Union, but in the context of developing uh, local friends right. and allies and partners for the long term, probably didn't make a lot of sense at all. And so, for sure, long term ramifications that we still see. That's exactly now. the point. Yeah. And, and so we run the risk of if we have the wrong frame of reference here, we run the risk of repeating some of those mistakes. Sure. And so, yes, there is a, an emerging, in my view, an emerging greater power competition, whether it's you know China, Russia, whatever it is. But at the same time, we have to maintain the proper lens for how we deal with the Western Hemisphere. Again, I, you know, most of the countries in the Western Hemisphere are very sympathetic to a, a good relationship with the United mm-hmm. States. We share values, we share uh, histories, we share democratic uh, practices, uh, we share economic relationships, we share cultural relationships. We, you know, there's a language component here that's very, you know, common. The uh, United States is what the third or fourth largest uh, Spanish-speaking country in the world after Spain and Mexico, if I'm not wrong. So here you have uh, some real connectivity tissue here, and it's a lot to build on and you know shame on us if we don't see that and if we, if don't, we forget that and only sort of that's exactly filter right. everything through or exactly bounce everything right. off of china and russia my contention is we have to see la- the value of latin america because latin america is valuable not because it's a, an adjunct to the sure. the discussions with russia great uh, so the last question I have is, as our listeners are reading or watching or listening to news um, globally, right, breaking news stories are coming out, what things should catch their attention uh, about Latin America? What should they maybe listen out for or watch out for in the coming uh, weeks and months? There's a lot of news coming out of the region that doesn't quite make it into U.S. newspapers, uh, but that doesn't make it necessarily uh, unnewsworthy. I think the one that uh, people will be hearing a lot more of, uh, unfortunately, because it just means that the situation is deteriorating, is Venezuela uh, and the continuing humanitarian crisis there. Uh, I think uh, the story of uh, economic health and well-being is a story that's increasingly going to be uh, of interest in the Latin American context, particularly uh, to the extent that the coronavirus issue uh, becomes more prominent, not necessarily in Latin America, although that's certainly a possibility, but you know, Latin America, particularly South America, depends mightily on China in terms of its uh, top market uh, for the, the export of commodities. And so to the extent China is slowing, and it is, to the extent that the demand for South American commodities is being reduced, and it is, that's going to hit South American economic growth. And that's a story that uh, that Mm -hmm. is going to be told increasingly. Uh, I think you also have um, a couple others that people just, you know, will want to be mindful of. One is the story of Mexico is always important to the United States because we share an 1800 mile border. Uh, And so whether it's migration, economic growth, um, security issues like uh, law enforcement issues, uh, we're going to be hearing a lot about that, particularly in an election year in the United States. And then finally is, uh, is increasingly we're going to be hearing the environment mental story. And if we remember last year in 2019, uh, the burning of the Amazon right. was a huge story as it should be. This is not just a Brazil story, quote unquote. Uh, Bolivia has a large part of the Amazon, Peru, Colombia, Venezuela has, uh, you know, is doing some very destructive things in the southern part of the country in terms of illegal mining and such things. But Brazil has the largest share of the Amazon. And to the extent uh, Amazon burn growth rate uh, or the growth of Amazon burn uh, increases, uh, you know, that will catch the attention of the international community. Uh, And so that issue is going to have to be worked with sensitivity. Uh, Brazil uh, is the sovereign there. Brazil does have its own historical sensitivities. Brazil does have development aspirations, uh, and those are all legitimate. So the question is, how do you merge the internet, the needs of the international community in terms of the global environmental issues, along with Brazil's very legitimate uh, domestic concerns as well? And that's a really tough nut mm-hmm. to crack, uh, something that we're going to be hearing more and more of, I would yeah. predict. But uh, it's a fascinating region. 
the stories, uh, I guess my hope would be that even as some of these uh, stories are perhaps on the negative side of the ledger, that nonetheless that uh, observers and listeners are, are understanding that indeed the region, uh, there's huge opportunity there. Uh, the good news stories don't often get told, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Uh, and it's a real region of potential partnership for the United Great. States. So looking out for, again, these regional transnational issues that affect the United States, uh, that affect regional security uh, in the in the Western Hemisphere, uh, looking for good news as well mm-hmm. as as well as bad, and then thinking about Latin America on its own on its own terms yes. uh, as individuated sovereign states with which the United States has relationships uh, and also has regional interests and things like that. I think all really important uh, points for national security professionals and military professionals in particular to uh, to think about. So, Eric, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today on a better piece uh, with the War Room. This is Jacqueline Witt. And we're signing off. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.